Blessings and salutations. Yurima Karama here again with Real Life. This is Real Talk. So I wanted to talk about a few different subjects here in a short amount of time. One, I just had a talk to a friend of mine and he was telling me about a situation that just recently happened at OSU, Ohio State University here in Columbus, where they had a student sit in and some of the issues that they were bringing up was uh, basically one was the they just recently, I think, put forty two million dollars into uh, the stadium where they play their games at. And one of the issues that was that they wanted to talk to the president of OSU about is, OK, if you have this money to a lot for a stadium, forty two million dollars for whether it's renovation or building on to the stadium, it doesn't matter. If you have that type of money, then you can invest some millions into scholarships for minorities, for minority students. Well, and let me clarify, the president is black. He couldn't be found, of course. Uh, he didn't want to have that conversation. The other issue also, or there was actually a few issues, but that was one, the allocations of funds for uh, scholarships for minority students. The other issue was that they brought up or wanted to talk about was uh, divest, divesting of Hewlett Packard, HP, and Caterpillar over in Palestine because they're... Uh, uh, part of Israel's oppression of the Palestinians. And you have quite a few foreign students here that, that, that go to OSU, and these are considered human rights abuses. So they wanted to, they wanted information on divesting Hewlett Packard and Caterpillar. Well, OSU said that, and although OSU is a public university, they said that they don't have to share that information because those are trade secrets and they are part of trade secrets. They don't have to give that information up. So <clears throat> the students <clears throat> had this sit in and they had it hey, they had it at the administrative building at OSU. Basically went all day and uh was going into the night. What I found interesting was uh and this was a group of students all different racial backgrounds, uh, you know, white, black, Hispanic, uh, uh, Middle Eastern. So, but what I found interesting was uh, my partner said that over the course of a couple hours, uh, large amounts of police started showing up. And so <clears throat> eventually it came down to the point of them saying, hey, you got to leave or be arrested and you can be expelled from 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 school. And so my point to him was that, you know, especially for especially for like the black students, you know, because when we're talking about forty two million dollars going to basically sport and play, you're talking about putting forty two million into a stadium. And now the students want to talk about, well, that's fine and dandy, but if you have that money, that much money to allot to a stadium, what about allotting some money to scholarships for minority children? And then you get threatened with arrest. You get threatened with expulsion. When we have some brilliant minds who are willing to stand up, it would be kind of nice if they were able to leave OSU. And, and, you know, take their talents elsewhere. Kind of like LeBron left Cleveland and took his talents to Miami and got a championship. Well, it would be nice if they could leave and go to some historically black colleges who offer the same PhD programs or master's degree programs or whatever. Because at the end of the day, I think that that tends to speak louder when you have a group. Because at the end of the day... OSU has been having racial problems. They don't have racial issues when they're cheering on their black athletes. But outside of that, understand that OSU is, what, 3.2, 3.5% black at that. Uh, and that's men and women. So they've been having racial issues. Find another school. And what I'm telling this brother is that these, plant, these are plantations. 
These are plantations, plain and simple, and they have the plantation mentality. I don't care if the president is black. They have the plantation mentality. So they're showing you really how much they care about you, which is not. They care more about a stadium. He was telling me about a, about a situation where they have a place there where they have more, you see more dogs, more dogs on the, at this particular place than you do see, than you see black athletes or black students and the dogs get more respect than some of the students. So, you know, it, it, this whole plantation thing, and that kind of leads me into my next subject, which is uh, black businesses in black communities. We rarely see them. And this was another conversation that we were having. And I was expressing to him that we have become so discombobulated, so desensitized as a people that those things that are actually abnormal, they seem normal. They they seem normal to us. We don't even are, are thinking such as black community. When you see Asian nail shops, even though we are the inventors of the hair, the nails, doing doing all the different designs and all of that. We we are the inventors of that, but that's changed. So the black community, you see the Asian nail shops, you see the Asian or the Middle Eastern Middle Eastern Indian gas stations. You see corner stores which are owned by, you know, Indians. These things are abnormal to come into the black community and not see black business owners because you're not going to go into the Asian community and see black business owners. That's going to seem abnormal. As a matter of fact, you'll probably be ran out of business very quick with maybe within the first week um, of trying to do business there because they're going to look at you. You're not going to you're not going to get any customers. People coming into the black community, I believe that they kind of expect to see black business owners. They kind of expect to see that. Even with the level of gentrification that's going on now by, by, by white people taking trying to take back those communities, they still tend to see coming in, they tend to want to see or expect to see black business owners. These things, we kind of look at them as if they're normal now. Oh, it's just normal to see Asian shop owners. It's just normal to see Indian shop owners. It's normal not to see black business owners in the black community. It's ridiculous. We have to change. We have to change that mindset. We have to get that entrepreneurial spirit. We have to take back those communities. We have to rebuild. Because, and the reason this is important is because we spend that money with the Asians. We spend that money with the Indians. We spend that money with the Middle Easterns. They don't put any money back into the community. They take it right out. And then we wonder why the why the hood is dilapidated, why it's in a wretched state. Because there's no money being put back into the community. Nothing. And the governments, they're not going to do it because all of those monies and subsidies, they go to the suburbs first. So you basically, again, plantation, get the crumbs off masses plate. Whatever's left over will extend to your community. Crumbs. So last but not least, Black Lives Matter. There's some, and we've seen this in the past for those who are student have studied history. We've seen how organizations become, you know, they get taken over. They they fall because of egos, because of a number of different things, disorganization being the main one. So there is discourse within the Black Lives Matter movement right now. From my understanding, there is fragments, people fragmenting themselves now, people disappointed or upset because they feel like one person is becoming, is getting all the shine from MSNBC and, and nobody else is getting the shine and, and, you know, one person is being the spokesperson and they don't want that person to be the spokesperson. They think others should be the spokesperson. And what this is, is simply a lack of disor it's, it's disorganization complete disorganization. And I think, I believe what happened is sometimes movements spawn, they catch fire and they take off and you forget the most essential things that are needed. You need a mastermind group. That small group 
It can be five to seven people, might not even be that many, but that small group that when decisions are made, that's it. The founders of the group, if you're not spokespeople, that's fine. You don't have to be out front, but a spokesperson needs to be chosen and that spokesperson needs to be pushing the Black Lives Matter agenda. Also, the movement should not be stagnant. The movement should not be on a decline. It should be on an increase. So we're not, we're not, it's like we're not hearing about it anymore. And I'm not a Black Lives Matter uh, 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 participant or member, but I do like what they did or and what they have done up to this point. I think there needs to be more, obviously, but that more comes with organization. What's the agenda? What is the demand? What do you want? Set that out. Set that out. And then have that spokesperson. And that spokesperson is pushing that agenda. And if MSNBC doesn't want to talk to that spokesperson and they want to go over here and talk to that person, that person refuses. No, you talk to our spokesperson or you don't talk to nobody. It's that simple. That's how organizations run. This is our spokesperson. This is the person that we put out front. If you don't like their radical nature, well, too bad. You just don't talk. These are these are our demands. This is what we want. And you have that agenda, you have and you have those people in place. You have those people in place. Take out take out the religious aspect of the nation of Islam. It's a successful organization. When you when you take out the religious aspect and I I don't like using the religious thing because every organization is not doesn't have a religious thing to it. You can be a re, an organization without having the religious thing to it. Now you might want to have the spirituality with it. That's going to be very be beneficial. But the religious thing you don't have to have it, but check out Nation of Islam. Their organization, they're organized. And when those ministers tell their organizations, "Hey, this came from the minister, this is the agenda, this is what we're pushing." That's followed. That protocol is followed. And when it's not, they're suspended. They're out. They're they're uh, disenfranchised from the organization. They're ostracized. Move on. And sometimes it just has to be like that. When you're serious and you're an organization, you have to push and people have to understand that. So just wanted to put that out there. Uh, you Black Lives Matter, get that organization. Sit down, get you a mastermind group. Four to seven people, five to seven people, it doesn't matter. People that are trusted, who have, are on the same vibe, who have the same agenda, and people who are not afraid to say, no, I, that's not going to work. And you being willing to respect that because you respect that person. Let's push. Push that. With that, my name is Yurima Karama. I'm... Uh, Connect with me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you know, uh, my webpage, Um Also, got two books that I'm currently working on, hoping to get them done uh, relatively within the next couple of months, and working on the new album. Hit me up, connect with me, looking to do some touring and, and some traveling, so I might be in a place near you, just uh, started a new business venture, so I'm pushing that. I'm excited about life right now. I'm excited about us as a people, but we need to get excited, and we need to start pushing. We need to start stepping up. Forget asking. Asking, we've we've been in, been put in a position to ask. When, uh, we ask once, that's it. After asking once, then it becomes begging. We don't beg. Push. Move forward. We don't need anybody. We're smart enough. We're intelligent enough. Take our lives back. Take our children's lives back. Let's go. Yurima Karama won.